Hi everyone, this is a new session where we get to talk about a very important topic that has been uh, on, my, my, on my mind for a couple of weeks now to uh, basically talk about you know security and uh, the amount of vulnerabilities and trust that we uh, put in naively, you know, with or without knowing uh, into the tools and the libraries that we're using. So let me just kind of draw a picture for you here so you just understand, you know, where I'm coming from and hopefully you'll kind of be able to go with me into the place I want to take us both. Um, you are a, a software engineer. Obviously, you're not, you're building domain systems. So you're not in the business of building tools. So you're, you rely on other tools and other libraries like, you know, uh, Newton Soft, JSON, and uh, you're relying on, you know, libraries like, like Easy Rest and, and Fake It and libraries like these to kind of build your domain systems. You're not concerned with reinventing the wheel into developing a library that does testing or assertion or validation. So you rely on someone else's effort to kind of support you into getting to the place where you want to go in a high quality standardized way, right? So what you do is that you basically go and say, well, let me see what libraries are out there and what libraries are popular so I can go and pull these libraries into my domain system and use these libraries to develop, you know, the business requirements that I want to develop. In between these two steps, between you looking for a library and finding a library and installing it into that domain system, there is a little bit of gap there. There's an interesting gap that, you know, recent incidents have kind of brought up to the attention of everybody in the community. We, when we do research, when we do, when we pull libraries to use in our systems, uh, a lot of engineers will either use what the team is already using. So if you're joining a new organization or something and you didn't get to kind of make the, the decisions early on in the process and you have this big monolithic enterprise applications with hundreds of thousands of lines of code in it, you don't get the chance to actually go and say, I want to stir that or turn that ship around a little bit. You know, let me see what they already have and not try to shake the boat too much, right? So I don't kind of cause too much problems. Uh, what a lot of engineers do is that basically they just kind of say, okay, this is the status quo. This is what everyone else is using. Let me just go ahead and use that as well, right? Some other engineers will be like, let me see what's the most popular, right? Let me see what's most popular out there. Uh, let me just pick it up and just go ahead and run with it. Uh, some engineers will say, well, let me see what's popular, but also what's easy and cheap, but I don't have to pay money for it because I don't want to have the conversation with my manager or leadership or customers or whoever you're working with to kind of say, oh, you need to drop $600, $700 every month on a subscription, whatever the case may be. Little did people think how reliable and secure these tools and libraries that we're using are. What kind of principles and standards the people that developed these libraries and tools actually believe in? What philosophies do they come from? You know, why are they maintaining these libraries? What what is their 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 main uh, a, a kind of uh, purpose, you know, into continuing to push this. And a lot of people in the open source uh, community, they have the best intent at heart. But at some point in time, people change, right? The maintainers of certain libraries will have a change of heart, a change of mind, you know, they will see something going very, very uh, uh, rising up and getting more popular. And then they start thinking, hmm, how can I, you know, uh, uh, kind of profiteer off of this, uh, you know, in one way or another? Okay, so very little do we talk about, you know, the security, the, the things that matter the most into these systems that we're building. And usually when software engineers are building domain systems, not tools, they, they really think too little about the tooling and they're just focused on to getting the business requirements done. They said, why would I need to go reinvent the wheel with a validation library when there is, you know, fluent validations or fluent assertions or whatever the case may be. So... I started digging a little bit more into this kind of um, a common culture that we have, especially in the .NET community, but this is more popular across multiple languages. It's, it's, it's much widespread than anything else. And there are some uh, programming languages and some frameworks that kind of tackle this problem. They fixed it as a side effect. They tried to be cool, but they fixed it as a side effect, but it wasn't really the, the main purpose of them doing what they were doing. Like some libraries, some programming language will look straight at the open source code. Right? There's no packaging. There's no libraries. They just point straight at the source code uh, in GitHub or GitLabs or Bitbucket or whatever is all out there. And they basically pull the code from there and they process on it. 
But that's not the case in, in, in most of the programming languages that are used in the enterprise systems, like the Javas and the C Sharps and the C++ in the world. You know, all these packages are a completely different ball of wax, you know, than that kind of approach. Let's just take a look here at the map of the world, right? So I'm going to kind of show you here a an interesting dilemma an interesting diagram and you can you kind of tell me if you can relate to this or not right so this is let's just let's just go ahead in here and just say i have some code right this is this open source code let's see if i have github in here i probably do so you have your code sitting in github so that's github right and this is some code base sitting in there and then you have a can i get a can i get a logo for new git that would make me happy let's see no git a uh, logo I want to make this pretty as much as possible. It's just my um, <laughs> OCD. Yeah, there you go. So, okay, so you have NuGet sitting in here, right? And a lot of engineers will just go and say, well, you know, it's open source, so I guess it's okay. Because nobody screamed and cried and said there is a problem in it. So I guess there's no problem in it. Why would I, what, why would I think otherwise, right? The issue here is that a lot of these, like this is here, this is NuGet and this is GitHub, right? And don't just th take this as GitHub. There's all all other kind of systems where I'm just talking about what's common in the .NET community. What usually happens, you know, in publishing these systems, some people do the right thing. They basically say connect our uh, build pipelines in GitHub to NuGet. Right, and it's not the most in intuitive thing in the world, you know. The the standard community team has been working on some of ideas to kind of generate that, but it's there, right? Some people just go here and be like, you know, direct release, which is the right thing to do, right? Because that basically means it increases the integrity and the you know kind of uh, uh, trust worthiness between the code that's in GitHub and the code that's in NuGet. Okay, that's fantastic. That's really good. No problem there. But what is the more common scenario, right? If I go here and just kind of show you um, what happens in the real world, and I'm guilty of this. It's, it's not, you know, I'm not saying that this is not something that we're free of. A lot of engineers will just do exactly that. What people do is that they're going to pull the latest code from GitHub like this and then build it on the local machine, and then they go back and publish it to NuGet. Okay, so this is your local machine right here. And your local machine, on your local machine, you're basically publishing these bits, right? So there is, this is the more common scenario, right? You're basically going and saying, well, I don't want to, you know, bother myself setting up the configurations and secrets and, you know, NuGet is, is, is very hard to set up or whatever the case may be, whatever excuse is out there, especially if you're doing something open source, so you're not really getting, you know, paid for it. So it's, it's based on your own intentions and your own kind of preference whether you want to do something like that or not. Okay, so you're pulling code. So this is code. So this is pulling, co pulling code, and then you're releasing like this. This here is probably one of the most common ways NuGet packages exist today, right? Some people do the right thing, some people don't, you know, and some people just go ahead and basically say, you know, I, I built the library, it's my own library, I'm publishing for myself, nobody owes me anything, I don't owe anyone anything, so this is how this is going to be. You know, I'm going to pull the code like this, and then I'm going to publish this code back to NuGet, no harm, no foul. Now, <laughs> you can see now why this, this is a problem, right? Because if the person or the machine that is building this gets compromised, then what, what you really see on GitHub is not really a match to what you see in NuGet, right? Like I can pull the code and add in anything I want in there, and then I can push that straight into NuGet packages, and hey, this is release 3.5, and look, you know, the NuGet package has a reference to open source library, so it must be good, right? But in reality, it's not. Anybody can put anything nefarious, anything uh, critical in there, and there is no way to tell. Today, there is no way to tell, right? Some people, you, if you go to the blog post from the NuGet team uh, at Microsoft, they'll tell you things about, well, we, ha we have an author signature, and we want to verify that the hash of the build and all that kind of stuff. It's all great, but you're assuming that Here's a big problem with that. You're assuming that people actually follow this practice, right? This is a big 
issue with you know when you're trying to push a new form of standardization or processes on engineers it's very very hard to get people to move from a an old practice into a new practice especially when they don't see immediate benefit something that kind of impacts them directly right that's the issue so you have to work with what people already are doing you have to work on top of that you have to put the ball in your court and you have to do extra effort to verify this stuff I went on Reddit and I researched a lot, you know, and there is really no good solution out there. You know, a lot of people recommended things like, oh, well, why don't you just use I'll Spy? I'll Spy or I'll Spy is basically a library that kind of decompiles and extracts the code, you know, from your DLL and basically allows you to see what this code is doing. But let's just be honest, you know, how many engineers out there that are going to be using a NuGet package that are going to actually go and decompile every DLL they're using. Like I've seen a guy the other day, um, he said we have 2,800 and something dependencies, right? So do you really expect like each one of these dependencies have probably hundreds if not thousands of files? If people are doing their job right, you know, they're gonna try to separate the concerns as much as possible. It's gonna branch out, right? It's gonna be an enterprise system and it's gonna branch out. It's gonna have a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, files there. Well, the problem with that is that nobody's going to do that, right? Nobody's going to go and decompile the code and actually look through the code and think about it a little bit. I mean, I'll spy is a great idea because forget about signatures, forget about all of that. Signatures verifies that the author who published the library is the author of that library. That's okay, but what if the author himself is compromised? What if the author himself, his machine, or he has a change of heart or a change of mind, and he decided to put viruses into his code? What what do we do with that? Well, what if they decide to put spyware into their code? What happens, right? Like that ever happens, you know? It's not like from a real life experience or anything. So what we can do, I'll spy is a great start, but it's not the full answer. It's just one piece in the puzzle that can help us find the right answers, right? If we can combine I'll spy, and I'm going to show you in a second what I'll spy does, with with the ability to compare what's in the open source space, what claims the library can, claims to be in the open source space. We have a smoking gun here. We have an idea here. We have a good start, right? Let me just show you what I'll spy does. It's a very cool library or a tool. It's an open source tool. It has huge, huge contributions, and I think 18,000. I'll show you all the details about it. I'll spy what it does. I can open up a library like standard AI, open AI. This is from the DLL itself and it will decompile it. And it will basically, it's think about it as like reverse engineering. You're basically looking at the, the code that operates the library that you're working with. And if there's anything nefarious in there, you'll be able to detect it. But look how many files in there are in there, right? We really take our sweet time breaking down all our libraries into uh, classes and models and you can see like there's a ton of these who's gonna do that who's gonna do that work right I'm a busy software engineer I'm trying to build domain systems I don't have time to build to review all this right we need something else in there to kind of review that for us okay so the standard open AI library for instance is basically saying you, there is a file broker if I open up that file broker they have a function in there and this function is returning an open read. So it basically takes a path of a file and it goes and reads that path. Fantastic, right? Let's go see what the open source, you know, version of that does. So let's go up in here and I'm going to go to standard open AI and this is the open source version and this is what it looks like. Stream, read file. You can notice something off the bat, right? The decompiler doesn't decompile exact match right like i fat arrow my methods if they're single liners this is something the entire standard community does when they're building software right it makes the code easier simpler more beautiful sure the decompiler doesn't understand that the decompiler will go and basically print out what it thinks that this code is doing it's reverting it so it's gonna it's, it has its own rules to kind of reconstruct back these bits into c sharp code Well, that's a problem because for a person that's trying to ensure what's in the open source repository matches what's in in that particular file, if I go and do string to string match, it's going to fail. 
it's going to go and say, wait a second, something horrible and terrible has happened because this code base does not match this code base, even though the change is not really significant. Like if you're reviewing this manually, there is no way you're going to look at this and be like, oh my God, this is a virus. We need to do something about it. So obviously, you know, the last piece in that puzzle is AI, right? If we can take this code to AI, I'm going to take this whole code here to AI, right here, and I'm not going to say uh, compare the following two code snippets and uh, report whether these snippets uh, have any significant functionality change or security. Oh, so let's just start with the uh, functionality change. So this is snippet one, number one. Here's the first snippet, and then here's the second snippet, snippet number two, and let's take in the one from uh, from the from the from I'll spy. There's I'll spy, put it up in here, and then let's just see what AI has to say, right? So here's AI. The two code snippet uh, appear to have very minor differences and don't seem to have any significant functionality change. Ah, so now you're thinking. You see the pieces here. They, these are the Lego pieces, right? So, so I can I have NuGet. I can pull the libraries from NuGet. I can pull the source code. I can compare the two using AI, and it will tell me for a fact, for real, whether something is actually uh, um, uh, has any significant code changes. Is this code base actually true to what it says it is? That's one part. But there's the other part. I can also take that particular decompiled code, which is in here, and I can basically go and say, do you see any uh, security uh, vulnerabilities? I'll never spell that word right. I don't know. Vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities uh, in snippet number two. So I can talk to AI, and I can basically say, hey, there, there doesn't seem to, to appear that there are any security vulnerabilities. This is how AI is useful, guys, right? It comes in and it basically says, you know, fuzziness, you know, two things are, you know, it's an apple and it's a little bit of an older apple. They're not the same color, but they're both apples. That's where AI comes in and becomes very, very useful for you. Okay, can we then develop a POC that can do that for us? So basically, here's the requirements for this POC. I'm going to steal these two icons in here. And here's the requirements of this POC. I'm going to basically go here and say, I want to pull this code base down. So I, I'm going to go and pull this code base down into this machine in here. Pull the code base here, right? And then pull the library down in here. Same thing. But in addition to that, I'm going to go ahead and call OpenAI. Do I have a logo for OpenAI? I really hope I does. I, I do. Let's just see here. Open AI logo or chat GPT logo or something like that. This guy here. I want one that's a different color because I am in the, <laughs> let's see here. This one here, maybe. This one. So here is this guy. So now the third thing that I want to do here is to basically just go and run this this third piece, this third component right here. So I pulled this and I pulled this. Now I need to basically call this guy and get feedback and say, is this code base that I decompiled vulnerable? Right? Is this code base matching the open source code base? Is this code base, do you see any security in it? And do you see any issues? And is, is it something I need to review? Of course, you still have to have a human factor sitting up in here. And this human will basically look at, you know, the, the places where AI said, mm, I'm not sure about that part. That's when you basically engage people, right? Uh, this is the part where you basically employ technology to protect yourself and protect the people that are using your system, but also at the same time, you're making sure that you are still involved to make the final decision and the sign-offs on every release and whatnot. But instead of reviewing like 500 different files, you're only reviewing maybe 20, maybe 10, 
right? And if it's a community effort, you're basically just doing one or two and everyone else is doing their, their fair share of this. How, how do we architect a system like this, right? How do we go about architecting a system like this? Well, I need, I need a bunch of dependencies, right? We need a bunch of dependencies to talk to each other. We definitely need GitHub to talk to us. We need to talk to GitHub. Let me take a, the, let me take the video out so you can just see the whole thing. So we need to talk to GitHub. We need to talk to NuGet, right? We need to be able to talk to um, uh, Isle Spy. So these are all brokers. I also need to talk to OpenAI, right? So you need all of that. And then maybe an a, uh, an API, like a report AI uh, API that basically will kind of share the details about what happened to these repositories, right? So for every repository, you're running that scan, you're going and basically saying, what's going on? How do I ensure that my libraries are in a good shape, right? So, okay. So maybe we need a some orchestration piece, and this orchestration piece here will basically go pull the code from NuGet, pull the code from GitHub, decompile the code using I'll spy, and then basically send all that data over to AI to process and report. So we need basically some coordination piece in here that will basically go and say, okay, give me all that details that you just learned. Send it to AI, receive the feedback from AI, and then send it to a report uh, API. The report API is basically what other engineers will look at. So instead of them having to run this process manually, if they don't want to, they can just look at the library and basically maybe generate a tag on every open source repository that says this um, this particular repository is secure. This particular code is, a, is an exact match to the new release of this NuGet package, right? So just going back to this piece here, so this is like report API service or something like that. And then maybe there is a, this is OpenAI right here, OpenAI uh, API, and maybe I'll spy is their command line. So this is uh, I'll spy uh, CMD. You also have the CMD for NuGet. You also have the CMD for for uh, for GitHub. So you're basically running command lines on your local machine, and that's the flow. The flow here is that for every new release of a library that is being watched by this standard security system, you're gonna basically go here and say um, uh, code uh, gathering, code gathering, code extraction orchestration service orchestration service and this here is code analysis orchestration and then at the very top here basically code scanning coordination service see how the system is architected right so now for every new thing you need to trigger that system and that system will basically go and talk to the code extraction ex orchestration pull the github pull the new get get the information and then run I'll spy and then it will go back here and basically call OpenAI, right? OpenAI will give you the feedback and then you go send that report for some other uh, terminal or a dashboard or something like ideally on the other side here there will be a dashboard sitting on the other side consuming that API as well and that API basically will say here is why this code is secure and here's why this code is insecure and here's our concerns about it. If this is a security, a security community effort, then a lot of these vulnerabilities become mostly automated, right? A lot of these vulnerabilities because something that you, uh, the community is a discussion, right? I want to create the social media kind of security discussion and we're reviewing the code and people getting points, whatever the case may be. There's an idea out there that I'm trying to put, you know, and once we're done with the entity intelligence, I'm going to kind of rally the standard community to start building that that together because that's, of course, that's very, very pressing issue and it's a very interesting issue. But don't just take my words for it. Of course, I have to go kind of play around. So I went and I started this idea called new verify, new verify, that's new get package verify. And it really, it's just a POC. It's a very dirty POC. And it, what it basically does, it will go download the NuGet package and then generate files from DLL. This is the one that goes and calls IL spy to kind of actually turn that DLL into a bunch of files, right? And puts them in a temporary directory. It gives me back the directory for all these files. We're going to use it later. And then 
I want to go get the NuGet package details so I can get the source code. Like every NuGet package, like if you go hit NuGet.org, you're going to see on the side here there is source repository and project website. Right? This is basically how I know where to find, you know, the details of this. Right? If I go into exceptions or whatever library is out there, this is how we basically find out how this works. Right? But also additionally, it will go call GitHub and clone that project, that project URL that's coming in. And from there, it's going to start iterating over these files. If the files has a match at all, it will go and basically read the content of this file and read the content of the NuGet file and does the comparison. If the comparison is good, it will it'll print out the code. Let me show you what AI is doing here. It's basically saying respond only with true or false. Do you see any significant functionality change between the two code bases? This is code base one and two, and this is DaVinci 3. It's using our standard compliant OpenAI library, and it will basically give me back the results. Super dirty code, but you get the idea. That's the POC that I'm trying to put out there. That's why it's called POC, so we can throw it away and rewrite it. Or AI basically comes back and says, I didn't know how to process this. You're exceeding your tokens, whatever the case may be. It will print out AI token or it says no match. And then it prints out this entire report for me. I'm going to show you that report in a second. So let me just show you this in action. Don't just take my word for it. Let's just run NuGet verify in here or new verify. Here we go. It's pulling stuff. You know, it will say, hey, I found no matches. I will I will not have it iterate over all of them. I'll just wait a couple of iterations and I'm gonna show you what this looks like. It's really wild, it's really cool. Maybe I'll put a breakpoint here. Okay. So let's see how many files we have so far. I have about twenty three. Did they all air out? I really hope not. So let's see here. If I if I, I want to show you everything, but also the screen is not very. So check this out. See, it went and compared date time broker. It said, nope, don't see any significant problem. Don't see any significant problem and so on and so forth. You see what, what I'm up to here? This is really useful because now we're employing AI to go find potential vulnerabilities into our code. But as a community, it's open source. It's not. It's not a thing. I'm going to give you the source code in a second, but that basically what this system is supposed to do. Now, don't just take my word for it yet. You know, of course, it's going to keep iterating over these files and create like if I go into the directory of this, let me just show you what this does underneath under the hood. Uh, if I go into the bin directory .net 7, you'll see these these uh, GUID directories. These GUID directories obviously are supposed to be cleaned up after, uh, but uh, let's look at the most recent date on these. So it's about 9.33 p.m., something like that, and it's the 20th today. Yeah, I've been playing a lot with this all night. So here it is. So 9.30, 9.31 in here, you'll see that it pulled out and extracted. This is extracted code. This is not the actual source code that's coming from GitHub. And if you go back here, you'll see the, the other folder that's underneath it is the actual code that it pulled from GitHub. OK, and now it's doing this code comparison. It's finding file to file, you know, based on the file name. And it's saying, hey, does this make sense? Does this make sense? Does this make sense? And so on and so forth. Right. So <laughs> uh, that's the POC. I'm going to push that POC right now as I'm, you know, kind of uh, talking about this video. So you just get to see it and whatever. Um, I know I I left the I left the, uh, <laughs> I left the uh, key in here, but it's OK. I mean, OpenAI will catch it. And basically deactivate it immediately. And I'm a lazy guy, so I'm just going to do that. Uh, here's Hassan, NuGet Verify. This is not a private library. This is this is a POC uh, for a public NuGet packages um, uh, uh, verification, right? So this is my this is my upcoming project. Once we're done with Entity Intelligence. If you want to take that code base today and, and, you, and you're super excited about it, if you feel the passion about it and you're looking for a place where you kind of, I don't mind running multiple projects at the same time. Uh, we just need to find the, the people that are passionate enough about the project that they want to contribute to it. Ideally, once this project is done, people should have a public report where they can see, okay, this is my new Git package, but also what does it mean from a security standpoint? But more importantly, on the GitHub repositories, People can now brag about how secure their 
um, repositories are, so they can go put some of these uh, kind of, I, I forgot what they call them, right? Uh, one of these kind of signs or whatever, and it basically says this is standard secure. Standard secure meaning that we have scanned this and it, it lives up to uh, the measures of security, what's actually published on NuGet.org as bits absolutely 100% matches you know the source code in here but not just that we haven't found anything that stand out from a security vulnerability standpoint okay so you have the code base you know to go play with just just use your use the AI like you like AI opens up the doors for a lot of, it's not your enemy I promise you it's it's here to kind of help you out kind of simplify some tasks that were just simply Play around with it, try it out, see what happens there, and hopefully you're going to find some inspiration there. You're going to find some a, a, a purpose into developing something that's actually useful for humanity. It's useful for all of us, right? And it will help us protect us from any uh, potential uh, future threats, you know, to the systems that we're building that are really so much so relying on trust today. Um, I, I hope that's that kind of... It shows you the idea. This is a POC, like I said, there, there needs like productionization of this. It takes a little bit of time and effort, but eventually comes out, uh, just like what we did with OpenAI and, and any other libraries. Um, I hope you found this kind of inspiring, maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit useful and informative, maybe it opens your eyes a little bit. Uh, I also know I want to acknowledge that there are existing tools out there uh, that does some of that work, but from my perspective, I want it to be uh, AI powered, systematic, but also community driven, because again, we could fall into the exact same problem by saying, just, just so you guys understand from a, from a, from a vulnerability standpoint, you must have noticed, and those of you have noticed, look what I just did there. What's the difference between these two images? There's absolutely nothing to prevent this one from getting compromised as well. So how do we solve this problem, right? You know, do we do the builds out there in public? That's one way to do it. You know, we could have pipelines that are building in public and running these bits. That's one way to do it. There's some really, really, really fun and fancy and interesting engineering problems that we're going to face to solve this problem. Type here, open AI, because just, you know, again, OCD. But, uh, you know, that this is basically, this is basically the idea. Uh, other challenges is that this guy, the, the open AI, and I saw this with some other uh, projects. Some people like to be very... Um, they write some 2000, like for, for most of standard compliant files, you're going to find files don't exceed about 200 lines of code, which is an amazing advantage because when, when comparing file to file, I never have to deal with open AI kind of, you know, barfing errors about 4,000 tokens limit or anything like that. But if you try to scan a non-standard compliant project that is not necessarily following these rules, you might end up with one code base that has like 20,000 lines of code. And I've seen so many of these in the past. And now you're doing the comparisons and now AI is barking at you and is saying, hey, you can't exceed that limit. I've also thought about running uh, AI training model local. So people could just run this local without having to pay money to open AI. There are so many ways to improve this, but it's definitely a purpose and an endeavor for those who are looking for one to do, to follow. And it's definitely something that's beneficiary for yourself. You're going to learn a lot of skill sets. You're going to help a lot of people because you're going to protect a lot of people. But also at the same time, you know, you're going to evolve and with AI and we're pushing AI a little bit to these boundaries and seeing how much we can we can benefit from it. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free. Drop a comment in the comment section and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.